Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. Morning. Happy Palm Sunday to you. It's so, oh, thank you. It's so good to see you this morning. Um, like you saw in the video, my name is Craig Sorvik. I'm on staff here at NBC. I have been the student ministry director for nine years. Whoa, well, thanks for that. Um, and I am married to my high school sweetheart, Kelsey. We have three spectacular children, Lila, Lincoln, and Leo. Um, yeah, we've been calling Meadowbrook Church our home for, our church home for nine years. Um, first service, nobody was brave or bold enough to sit in these brand new chairs, yet Eric and Sally here are breaking in our new chairs for the sanctuary in the front row. Look at them. Unafraid, unashamed, they're, they're marking their, their, their territory. That's their spot. You wanted to sit in those chairs? Better luck next time. As a student ministry director, one of my highlights uh, of the year is taking my high school students on a trip to northern Wisconsin, Rhinelander, at a place called Fort Wilderness. Um, and it's, it's one of the best trips. And one of, uh, one of my goals for our winter retreat is, is, is pretty simple. It's my desire on retreat while students are on retreat to grow closer to God, to grow close, closer to the other leaders, and to grow closer to other students. It's very simple. Um, it's very sweet and short goal. It's attainable every year in addition to a few other goals I add. But I never expected to see just how close students would get on these types of retreats uh, on that weekend. So several years back, I had a student in the ministry. Let's just call him Ben. And as we, uh, we partner with another church on this winter retreat, and from that church, there's a girl. Uh, we'll just call her Kaylee. Um, those are their real names. But... <laughs> So here's a random fact. Before I joined staff here at Meadowbrook Church, I was a leader, uh, I was an attender of this other church that, that Kaylee was from. Uh, her family were good friends. I served in ministry with her dad, her brother, and her sister. I love their family dearly. So I know them well, and they know me. Now jump, up, jump ahead to my time here at Meadowbrook. I'm good friends with Ben's family, right? The parents serve with me in ministry. I'm in Bible study with Ben's dad. Ben's mom is one of my veteran middle school leaders in ministry. So I love their family dearly. I know them and they know me. But Ben and Kaylee didn't know each other until this one winter retreat several years ago. Um, so Ben and Kaylee, both from two different churches, both from great families, they finally meet and they're very interested in growing closer together. So for the record, winter retreats are not meant for dating relationships <laughs> to suddenly blossom. And yet um, they sometimes happen, uh, not often, but sometimes. And so after the retreat, after this winter retreat where they meet, I get two text messages. One from each of the dads. And the messages look something like this. I created this so that you could get a picture of what I experienced several years ago. This is Kaylee's dad. Hey, Craig, last night, Kaylee told me that a boy in her youth group, your youth group, asked her out. Could you give me the 411 on Ben? I assume he's a good kid, but as dad, I want to check. Also, we need to do lunch sometime. We never did get that lunch. Um, so then I get another text a couple days later from, from Ben's dad. At some point today, can I call you to talk about a certain female teenager from the other church that a certain male teenage individual in this household has lately become very interested in? <clears throat> so now that, to all the dads and teenagers out there, this is, a, this is a solid move. This is a good move to check and verify the people that know your, your kids and the people that are interested in your kids. Um, so what's um, really special Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. I did respond to the dads. I said, if there's a boy that you want your daughter to bring home, it's Ben. I said, if there's a girl that you want your son to bring home, it's Kaylee. Right? I did check with those dads. I did verify and I did tell them a little bit about uh, what they were getting into. And the sweet part of this story, um, so that was six years ago, and Ben and Kaylee are engaged today. So both dads were doing something that dads do. Um, but in a very straightforward sense, they were looking for a witness to the character of Ben and Kaylee and of their respective families. Witnesses are essential in establishing any claim to facts. When a, a news station wants to report an amazing event, reporters interview uh, eyewitnesses, right? We ex accept reports of credible witnesses, especially if there's a number of them who are in agreement, right? And so when witnesses testify to an event, we're kind of, we accept what they say to be true. So with Ben and Kaylee's dads, both were looking to me as a witness to the truth about who each person was. And so a witness is generally someone who's, you know, seen something, they can witness to what they have seen, and they give firsthand evidence. So they were there, as if they're, as if they're saying, 
I know it happened because I saw it. In like manner, John's gospel presents us with such witnesses to Christ. So witnesses establish truth. So we're going to look at John chapter 5. Uh, if you haven't gotten there already, I want to invite you to turn there. We're not going to have the text on screen, so make sure you have your Bible uh, up in front of you. Um, and just a reminder about the gospel of John. If there's a single verse that encapsulates the point and purpose of John's gospel, it comes from John 20 verse 31. John says, with these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the point and purpose of of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 31. If you could try and sum up the Gospel of John in one verse, it's that one, okay? So we're entering chapter 5 at verse 31. We'll take it all the way to the end, verse 47. Folks, we have 17 verses here this morning, and we are going to hit them all. I'm not kidding. I'm not. So buckle your seatbelts. Uh, please enjoy. It's going to be great. So um, Jesus just heals a man who's been diseased for 38 years. The Jewish leaders, they tried to criminalize him and, and punish him because he worked on the Sabbath day. He also made himself equal with God. So he's continuing this discourse in verse 31, where not only is he established that he is equal with God, but he provides witnesses to who he is and the work that he's doing. So I outlined the passage uh, for you. You can see it on the screen behind me. Basically, just the breakdown of the verses discussing each of the witnesses from John the Baptist all the way down to the witness of Moses. And we'll see in that, that fifth point, we're going to look at the reasons for the Jewish leaders', leaders unbe unbelief. Before we read the text this morning, let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together, that we can be here in this time, in this place, in this space, to be able to worship you, to glorify you, and to seek wisdom from you and through your word. Allow your word to transform and change our hearts and our lives so that we're not just merely knowers of the truth, but we're true believers of that. Uh, allow our hearts to be on fire for you and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, it's going to be John chapter 5, 31 through 47. If I, testify, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it, that you might be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works of the Father, I has, uh, for the works of the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you, have not, uh, that, you, that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you would believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So like I said, we're going to start right away. Verse 31. And Jesus says a really peculiar thing. It made me ask the question, why would Jesus say that? Are his words invalid or false? I don't, I, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. So Jesus, fully aware of the law and the Jewish leaders' standards, knowing that they would not accept his words alone, Jesus provides multiple witnesses. According to their law, in Deuteronomy 19.15 states, a matter must be established by a testimony of two or three witnesses. So this is their standard. This is their expectation. Jesus meets this and does not only use his words, but he uses several other testimonies to verify that he's the son of God. Jesus points out, uh, uh, Jesus points to somebody who has a true testimony about himself in verse 32, right? It's God the Father, right? which opens up this discussion of the various witnesses that Jesus provides to verify his credibility, right? Again, Jesus is not using John's testimony for, just for himself, but to provide for the religious leaders' standards for witnesses, for witnesses according to the Torah law. So 32 is a proclamation that God the Father testifies in favor of Jesus, and here we see in verse 33, Jesus' first witness. 
That is John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is a legendary figure. And after Jesus, John was the most pivotal figure in the salvation history of God. He's living in the desert. He wears this coat that's made of camel hair. He's eating bugs. That's who John the Baptist is. And his ministry ends this 400 years silence from the prophets, right? Because he enters under the scene. John was this voice that's crying out into the wilderness, preparing the way for the coming Messiah, preaching this message of repentance and of baptism. So in this context, his message and his ministry brought the culmination of all the law and the prophets, but it also announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. So John was this truly, you know, transitional figure. He's creating this bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? John crosses the span of history with one foot firmly planted in the Old Testament and the other squarely placed in the New. And John says a lot of different things about Jesus. Jesus is pointing and using John as a witness, his first witness, because of the things that John has to say about him, right? That he says he's the coming Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that he's called the Lamb of God, that John is there to make straight the way for the Lord, Jesus, So here in verse 33, Jesus declares that all that John is saying about him is true. Look at verse 34. What Jesus is saying here is that he doesn't need John's testimony just for himself, but for evidence for these religious leaders and for the purpose that he states in the latter half of verse 34. So he uses John as a witness so they might be saved through the message that John brought, that Jesus has been sent by God as the Lamb of God because he was the Son of God come to save. And the best part of this witness that him using the witness of John the Baptist was what he calls John in verse 35. Take a look. He said that John was the lamp which burns and shines. So a lamp is just a means to display light. Think about that. It's not light itself. So just like a fireplace is not a fire, just like a candle is not a flame, a lamp uses borrowed light. It does not light itself. A lamp is lit. So Jesus takes this vivid imagery of a light and of a lamp and of John the Baptist, and he compares it to John. John and his message had this warmth and shined bright. It was not a cold message of intellect and knowledge, but a hot, burning message of a heart for God. And as all lights eventually go out, the same is true for John. John says of himself in chapter 3, verse 30, he, being Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. So John is a true witness, and in his true witness to Jesus and the spread of the news that Jesus was the Son of God, he burns himself out. So the Jewish leaders were initially, like Jesus says in the passage, they're initially fond of John, and they rejoiced in his life, in, his, in the light that he shined. But it was temporary. It was kind of the fleeting fondness, just like a child is fond of a new thing, but then they grow tired of it. The leaders kind of grew tired of John and grew tired of his ministry. Now, many people are like that. Or you might even know somebody who's like that, who's initially impressed or pleased or affected by the gospel, right? They're kind of turned on to it. And then eventually over time, they start to forget about it, ignore it, despise it, and reject it. And so we as Christians are called to be like John. We're called to be like lamps because people are similar to lamps because we can have the capacity to be lights. The question is, are we shining that light? Are we burning bright just like John is? here in this passage. Because John was a lamp who shone brightly. He was a witness to people where they could see and he could provide a clear and well-lit path to Jesus. So that's our first witness that Jesus presents to us, the witness of John the Baptist. Let's look to verse 36, the witness of the works of Jesus. Right? And Jesus says in verse 36, I have a testimony weightier than that of John for the works the Father I've has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. So, that, so again, Jesus, in this passage of chapter 5, he just healed a man, right? He just healed a man who'd been sick and diseased for 38 years. So the witness of the works are of the miraculous works that Jesus does all throughout his earthly ministry, all right? So it's the ministry that he does, all the healings that he does, the power over nature and physical matter, the resurrection of Lazarus in a few simple words, even his awareness and his knowledge of the human heart and the human mind that he clearly displays to the people he speaks with. It's like he says to the, to the religious leaders right here in this passage. He says, I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in, his, in your hearts. That's the works of Jesus. Right? That's Jesus being and showing that he is God. The powerful works that he displays is evidence that God has sent him on mission to bring people to him so they might believe and that they might be saved. 
Let's jump to the next witness, this witness of God, the witness of God the Father in verses 37 and 38. And this is the greatest witness, the weightier witness, which is God the Father. And there's a couple of examples in Scripture that we see God audibly recognizing that Jesus is his son. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, and the text says, a voice sounded from above that said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus' father answered his prayer, Jesus' prayer, directly and audibly when he said, Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. And God, his father, answered, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again in John chapter 12. So God the Father makes for the greatest witness or testimony because God saw and knew well before Jesus was on earth. He saw him as his son eternally. Like it says in John 1, 1 through 3, God saw that what his son would be in history when he came because he saw he could witness. So both, both in verse 38, uh, 37 and 38, Jesus addresses the religious leaders directly. He says, you've never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you for you do not believe the one he sent. This is a direct attack on their lack of belief in Jesus. They are deaf, they are blind, they are empty, and they are unbelieving. Their inability to see and hear God shows that they're ignorant. They think that they know God, and they think that they're close to him, but their unbelief shows that they're far off. Like the text says, God's word does not dwell in them. It's among them, it's near them, they can, they can hold it, but it does not dwell and remain in their hearts. If it truly was, then they would readily accept Jesus. Instead of constantly trying to have an intellectual joust with him or to trip him up or how he's breaking the, the, the laws and the rules that they established, there's a massive difference between knowing about Jesus and truly believing in Jesus. There's a massive difference between knowing about Jesus and truly believing in Jesus. I am a big, big movie fan. I love watching movies and quoting movies. And I was reading this passage, a really random scene popped into my head. Uh, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, this comes from Pirates of the Caribbean 2, Dead Man's Chest. Um, I told you it was random. So there's these two characters that were introduced in the first film. They're kind of like the comedic, the comedic relief. They're like funny guys. There's a couple of pirates. In the first film, they're part of this pirate crew that's kind of immortal. Nothing can happen to them. They lose that. The curse is broken. And in the second film, we're reintroduced to them, and they're in this long boat in the middle of the Caribbean, and there's, there's, there's these two pirates, like bad guys turn good guys. One's named Rigetti, and one is named Pintel. And the picture behind me, Rigetti is holding a Bible. But what you don't see is that he's got a wooden eye, and the Bible's upside down, right? And so here's, here's how that scene kind of plays out, and how you're introduced to the characters. Um, he's reading the Bible. Pintel says, what are you doing? And he goes, well, since we're not immortal no more, we've got to take care of our immortal souls. And he's reading the Bible upside down. And Pintel goes, you know you can't read. And Rigetti says, it's the Bible. You get credit for trying, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you'd hear a pirate voice today. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, right? It's funny, but remember who wrote that, right? Hollywood wrote that scene. Hollywood wrote that dialogue and that script, and he put it in for, for the laughs that you guys just did right now. There's a common incorrect belief that as long as you make an effort to read the Bible, then you're good. And you have eternal life as long as you try to read the Bible. But as we'll see, there's more to it than just knowing about the Bible. You have to truly, truly believe. It brings us to the witness of the Scriptures in verses 39 to 40. Verse 39 shows us, uh, Jesus uses to show that he is God, the Son of God, and this is Scriptures. It's so good, I want to read it one more time for you guys. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have this life. So for the religious leaders, it was their job, it was their duty, it was their business, it was their obligation to study the scriptures. They kept the law to a T and even developed their own practices and rules to ensure that nobody broke the law, to ensure that it was always honored. So Jesus says to them, you think that you have everlasting life in the scriptures. Because although they kept the faith and the hope of everlasting life because of their scriptural knowledge, they missed it because they were looking for it through this bare reading and study of the scriptures. It was a common and wrong saying among these Jewish religious leaders that was said, he that has the word of the law has everlasting life. So they thought they were certain of heaven, but they rejected it through their heart. 
right? Because they thought they could give an in-depth analysis or give, give passages of Scripture, have everything memorized, all the things they taught from years and years of tradition, but they missed it. It's not a, it's not a lack of knowledge about Christ, but a lack of willingness to come to Christ. So their knowledge and their studying and their tradition and their stat, status kind of saturates their heads, making them big-headed in their thinking that they willingly reject the life that Jesus comes to give. Imagine your home overlooks the ocean. It's a beautiful, picturesque view. You have a bay window. It allows you to see the sunset every single day. You see the crashing waves. You see the sun glistening across the water. Clouds stretch across the horizon. Every color you could think of, you could see that every day. Now imagine, imagine instead of focusing on that view, you start looking at, you look at the frame of the window. You look at the glass of the window. You look at the structural layout of the window. Contemplate the work that was put in to get the window there. You start noticing the smudges or the spots on the glass of the window. Now you would think that's absolutely ridiculous to not enjoy the ocean view. And sometimes our study of Scripture can be like that. It's a mistake to only approach Scripture to nitpick or examine or analyze or solely criticize its teaching. Just like the purpose of a window is to see the outside, the purpose of the Bible is to see the work and person of Jesus Christ as he's revealed in Scripture so that we might believe and be saved. So it brings us to the reasons for the unbelief of these religious leaders that Jesus maps out in verses 40 through 44. I'm going to go through them quickly. Verse 40, Jesus offers life. And this life is rejected. They're unwilling to come to him. They're unwilling to truly believe in him. In verse 41, Jesus wasn't looking for the honor or for the attention that the leaders were ready to give what they thought the coming Messiah would be. They expected a Messiah to come with this political power, this political leader with a military focus, and Jesus was not that. In verse 42, Jesus reads them. He reads their hearts. He says, I know you. The true reason for the rejection of Jesus was not of the mind, but of the heart. The religious leaders could hide behind their intellectual excuses. Their real problem was their lack of love of God in their hearts, their lack of true belief. And that showed in their cold response toward Jesus. Had they truly had the love of God in their hearts, they would have treated Jesus differently and they would have accepted him. Verse 43, he comes being sent by the Father and is not even received by his own people. There were many others around the same time of Jesus that were popping up and claiming to be these new up-and-coming messiahs, and some Jewish groups readily accepted them and wanted to thrust them into power. If Jesus were to cater to the wants of these religious leaders and to be the messiah they wanted him to be, then they would have accepted him. But because he, he didn't, they refused to accept him. Verse 44, the religious leaders strive to give each other glory and honor, based on their own religious accomplishments, their own religious success, and their high-level knowledge, but didn't truly desire the only honor that mattered, which is the honor that comes from God. There's a preacher, teacher, theologian from the 1800s that I I learn a lot from and I really uh, enjoy. His name is Charles Spurgeon, and he was an English preacher. Um, He has this wonderful quote that I wanted to share with you. He says, Christ is a person, a living person, full of power to save. He has not placed his salvation in sacraments or books or priests, but he has kept kept it in himself. And if you want to have it, you must come to him. He is still the the one source and fountain of eternal mercy. So the religious leaders were unwilling to come to Jesus based on their belief that they didn't even need Jesus, that they were fine, that they had the books, They searched the scriptures, for in them they believe they have eternal life. They did not believe that Jesus was God. They didn't believe that he was sent by God. Their knowledge got in the way. That leads us to our our final witness. Jesus maps out in verses 45 through 47. Take a look. The final one that Jesus mentions is Moses. The leaders had a great respect for Moses, and they prided prided themselves in being disciples of Moses. They acted like they were followers of Moses in opposition to Christ. But Christ, Jesus, shows them that Moses was actually against them, that Moses is actually one that's going to accuse them. They thought, of, they thought putting in the works to have this vast knowledge of the Scriptures and following Moses' laws would save them, but Moses actually accuses them because of their rejection of Christ. Take a look at verse, verse 46. Jesus states that Moses and the Old Testament 
point to himself. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Right? So if these Jewish leaders were truly to believe in Moses, they would have believed in Jesus as the Messiah. The Old Testament clearly points to who Jesus was. There's a variety of scriptures and texts that show us that in Genesis chapter 3 and 22, 49, and Numbers 24 and Deuteronomy 18. And there's a couple of New Testament passages that refer to the Old Testament scriptures and point that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Messiah. There's a parallel between the writings of Moses and of Jesus' words. So rejection of Moses is rejection of Christ. And the gut punch of it all is in verse 47. Jesus isn't truly surprised that they don't believe. And the words he says, or the testimonies that he brings, he's not surprised that they're not following, that they're not tracking, that they don't believe in him. Because of the, because of the fact that they don't believe in what Moses says about Jesus in these first five books of the Old Testament, it's not strange that they're not going to believe in what Jesus has to say right now here in front of them. That's a truly sad position for the Jewish leaders to be in. With their big heads of knowledge, with their strict law following, they completely miss Jesus. They do not believe. And Jesus is showing them as he ends here that if you do not believe truth, you know now, you will never believe greater truth when you hear it. If you do not respond to what you know to be true now, you're not going to respond when you hear further truth. The Jewish leaders do not truly believe in Jesus. They had plenty of witnesses that point to Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah come to save, but they reject him. Partially due to the big heads filled with knowledge and the things they think they know, and the best model to counter that, the best model to avoid that, comes from that of John the Baptist, who not only knew about Jesus, but truly believed in Jesus. He had the intellectual knowledge. He had his heart changed. That's the difference. He had the intellectual knowledge and he had his heart changed and become on fire so much that his witness was a light, a bright and burning light that even the Jewish leaders were convinced of for a short while. So we're bringing it, if we bring it back to today, if we bring it back to 2024, there are a lot of people who operate like the religious leaders in Jesus' day, believers and non-believers alike. We think with the big, vast head knowledge that we know it all. Right, that we truly understand. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about Jesus, regardless if they believe in him or not. There are so many that know about Jesus. Right? Maybe it's just some facts about him. Maybe they have heard about him or learned about him once. Maybe they've memorized some actual scripture. Maybe they go to church. But they have never allowed the facts to become their personal reality. They allow the knowledge to flood and enlarge their heads without the truth ever penetrating and changing their hearts. So the main point, the focus, the takeaway for each and every one of us this morning is that knowing about Jesus can lead to a big head, but true belief in Jesus should lead to a burning heart. Knowing about Jesus can lead to a big head, but true belief in Jesus should lead to a burning heart. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with knowing things. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. It's a good thing, and it's a gift from God. It's what we do with that knowledge that matters. And, and truthfully, everybody starts at square one, at the beginning, with their first step of faith, when we have no knowledge about anything. So everybody starts somewhere. Each and every one of us in this room has a beginning on our walk with Christ. So again, there's nothing wrong with knowledge. But there's a big difference between just knowing about Jesus to true, belu true belief in Jesus. And that true belief should result in a life change that's so vast that our heart is on fire for Jesus and for the sake of his gospel. Our lives should look like that of John the Baptist that we saw early in the chapter. A life that sought to point to Christ in all things and in all times and that light was spread everywhere. If we truly believe in Jesus, then our lives should be forever changed with the, knowledge, with the knowledge that Jesus is Savior. The question is, are we living that way? Are we operating that way? Maybe we were at a time. Maybe there was a, a moment in our lives or a season in our lives where we were living with that burning heart, that fire for Christ, but maybe that faded. So then the question is, how do we change that? What do we do to fix that? So I was studying this passage. I found a unique way to look, uh, a, a unique way to learn and to take away something from the passage, and surprisingly, it actually comes from these religious leaders, not necessarily by the things that they did, but by the things they didn't do. 
We see how Jesus speaks to them, how he accuses them of unbelief. There are about, there are about nine things that Jesus says negatively towards these religious leaders, whether about something they did do or something they didn't do, but said in a negative fashion. So I took what Jesus attacked the leaders for, a few of them, and I just did the opposite, right? Verse 38, Jesus says, Your word is not, his word does not dwell in you, for do not believe the one he sent, right? So the opposite of that was just to be abide in God's word, abide in his word, right? The, verse 40, Jesus says to them, um, excuse me, my mistake, uh, Jesus says, yeah, you, you study the scriptures in verse 39, you think you have eternal life, but verse 40, he says, you do not come to me to have life. So the opposite of that is just come to Jesus for eternal life, it says in verse 40. And then 42, Jesus says, I know you, and I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. The opposite of that being just love God. So to abide in his word, Jesus calls these religious leaders out for not having the word of God abiding in them. Abide can also mean dwell or remain, right? We often have a hot streak of reading or studying the Bible, and then it fades. In order for us to abide in his word, you have to allow God's word to be a constant focus, a constant reminder, a constant and continual meditation, and allow God's word to transform and change our life and how we live to the point where God's word makes itself at home in our life where we would be lost without it. The next takeaway is to come to Jesus for eternal life. Jesus tells them that they think they have eternal life in the scriptures when truly it was standing right in front of them and they did not come to him. Jesus saw them as spiritually dead and it's the same for every single human being in existence. We are spiritually dead in our sins and our trespasses. And that is the truth. So without Jesus, without God stepping in and changing that, we do not have life. And Jesus is saying, come to me for I have life. For anyone who has not come to Jesus for eternal life, Jesus is the provider of eternal life. The gospel does not have to be complex. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised again. And if you were to not just know, but believe and confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That is the gospel. So for anyone who is not trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus is saying, come to me, I have eternal life. And he says a lot more than that if you continue to abide in his word. And the third thing, and this one sounds simple, love God. Super easy, right? But remember what Jesus was saying in verse 42 and who he was saying it to. He was speaking to the religious elite of the day, the best of the best, and he told them they didn't have the love of God in them? So what does that say about us? Right, do we love God with everything that we do? Do we have a love for his word? Does our love for God affect the way that we live our life? How we operate at work and at home in public? When the world sees us, does the world see a burning heart for Christ or a big head for ourselves? If we strive to do these things that the religious leaders failed to do, then we can have burning hearts for God and allow our lives to be a witness to him. When people see us, they will see him. Because we are not the light, we just point to the light. We just shine the light that is that of Christ, the light of Christ. So that's our big hope. Our big takeaway this morning is that knowing about Jesus can lead to big heads. But true belief in Jesus should lead to burning hearts. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And I pray that it truly transforms us and changes us. All for you and for your glory. God, I pray that we take the truth from um, Scripture. We take the truth from the passage that we read this morning. And we see Jesus as Lord. We see Jesus as Messiah, the Son of God, who came to save. And not only that, but to offer life to anybody who comes to him. So Lord, I pray that we can know that, we can believe that, and we can strive to abide in your word. Allow it to dwell and rest within our hearts and lives. And that we can love you in a way that the world sees that we have a burning heart for you. Not for our own glory, not for our own attention, but that we can just reflect that to you, God. That we can point to you and say, it's because of God. It's because of you. It's because of Christ that I live the way I do. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for being able to worship together. We pray this all in your son's mighty name. Amen.